In this section, we discuss linear elasticity, which is perhaps the simplest of the constitutive models for structural properties. But that doesn't mean that it is too simple to be of any practical use. In fact, a linear elastic material behavior is good enough in solving a lot of structural problems. There's a huge spectrum of problems that make use of linear elastic material models. But in this lesson, we have picked three specific examples. The first one demonstrates the stress analysis of a bike frame. The second shows the harmonic analysis of an electronic device on a shaker table. For the third example, we'll do something different. We'll see how the microstructure of a solid influences its macroscopic behavior. This will still involve linear elasticity, but we'll see the anisotropic aspects of it. Let's start with our first example, which is the stress analysis of a bike frame. The bikes are a great means for both transportation and recreation. A bike frame is the main structural component of the bike as it supports all the loads that are acting on the bike and it also holds the whole structure together. So it's important to make sure that the loads are distributed in the frame such that it can support them without undergoing permanent deformation. In this example, we'll perform stress analysis on one such bike frames. Here's the geometry of the bike frame. The weight of the rider is the major load that acts on it and it's generally distributed on three different locations. One portion of the load acts through the handle, one through the bike seat and the other through the bike pedals. The whole frame is supported on two roller supports which are at the shaft connecting the wheels. Using these as the loads and boundary conditions, one can perform the stress analysis. In this example, we assume that the bike frame is made of structural steel. So we model it using a linear elastic material model. And here are the material properties. Now we apply the total weight of the rider at these three locations and then apply the roller supports at these two locations. Since there are no net accelerations in the part due to these loads, the inertial effects are negligible. So we can perform a static stress analysis. Here's the stress contour for this model using a static analysis. We can see the way the stresses are distributed in the model. From the legend, we see that the maximum stress developed in the bike frame is about 30.6 megapascals. The purpose of this simulation is to see how the stresses are distributed in the bike frame and if it can take this load without undergoing plastic deformation. The structural steel material is known to yield at a stress around 275 megapascals, which is way more than the maximum stresses developed in this frame. So, we may conclude that the current design of the bike frame passes this design criteria. Notice that even if we decide to change the design or if we increase the applied load to such an extent that the frame starts to yield, it's not necessary to use a nonlinear model. We only need to know whether the maximum stress is more than the yield strength to decide on the design. If the maximum stress exceeds this limit, then the design already failed and we need not perform the simulation using a plasticity model as it won't add anything more to our analysis as far as our application is concerned. A similar stress analysis can be performed for several structural members such as trusses and bridges and buildings where it's very important to have a design that does not yield. The results from such an analysis can also be used as inputs for auxiliary studies such as 
fatigue analysis or the safety factor studies. Now let's look at our second example which is an electronics device that is mounted on a shaker table. The electronic devices usually have many small components that are soldered to a printed circuit board. These days we see such systems mounted on many environments that are subjected to large vibrations such as commercial cars. Under such vibrations the devices may be subjected to a lot of stresses which can result in failure of solar joints and result in component failure. This may be avoided by distributing the mass of the components on the board in such a way that the joint of no component is stressed beyond its failure limit. Let's simulate one such device that's mounted on a shaker table. All the materials used in this model are linear elastic materials. We'll subject the shaker to a harmonic load to mimic the vibrations. So we use a harmonic analysis. To do this, we first perform a modal analysis followed by a harmonic analysis using a mode superposition method. This way, we need not perform a full transient analysis, which is way more expensive. As an output from this analysis, we get the frequency responses. In this case, we look at the frequency response of equivalent stress. Here's the curve that we get for this particular example. What we see here is the maximum stress developed in the assembly when it's vibrating at different frequencies. From the chart, we see that the maximum stress in the model is developed at a frequency of 1160 Hertz. And if we look at the stress contour developed in the part at this frequency, we can see where the maximum stresses are developed in the full assembly. This analysis tells us which components are most susceptible to failures. And like I mentioned earlier, all the materials are linear elastic. If one is interested in a more accurate assessment of the component failure, then the analyst may still extract the reaction forces at the component and then use it as an input for a system level model. So this is another example that shows how useful a linear elastic material is used in performing structural analysis of mechanical systems. Now let's look at the final example. In this example, we'll not focus on a mechanical design. Rather, we'll focus on the microstructure of a solid and see how it influences the macroscopic properties of the solid. We have discussed earlier that all the material properties are related to the microstructure of the solid. If the microstructure has any directional structure, it will introduce anisotropic properties. To understand how this pans out between the scales, let's look at three different structures and see how it affects the macroscopic behavior. Let's start with a body-centered crystal structure, which is commonly seen in metals. This microstructure has two different materials called as the base and the particle. Each of these materials have different material properties and they are shown here. This unit is called as a representative volume element, which is extracted from a solid at a bigger scale. Each unit has two different materials that are structured in a certain way. When many such units come together, they result in the overall mechanical behavior of the solid. In this case, when we calculate the effective material property of the solid, here are the Young's modulus, shear modulus, and Poisson's ratios in three principal directions. As we can see from the table, all the values are uniform in all the directions. So, this material can be isotropic in nature, even though it is made of two different materials. 
Now let's look at the next representative volume unit, which again has two materials, wood matrix and wood fiber that have different material properties. In this case, we see a clear directionality where the wood fibers are present in one direction. Let's perform a similar calculation for this unit and calculate the effective material properties. Here are the Young's modulus, shear modulus and Poisson's ratios in three principal directions. As we can see from the values, they are different in all three directions, which makes this material anisotropic. Finally, let's look at one last unit where the structure is seen in woven composites. In this case, the material is braided and immersed in a matrix and together they provide the structural support to the material. In this case, we have a matrix and the yarn and each has very different material properties. Let's calculate the effective material properties for this unit. Here are the values for the Young's and the Shears modulus and Poisson's ratio. In this case, we can see that the material has identical properties in two principal directions, but very different properties in the third direction. So, the material is isotropic in a plane and anisotropic in a direction perpendicular to it. Such a material is called as transversely isotropic material. Such woven composites commonly find their usage in various applications such as propeller blades, auto bodies, chassis and even biomedical devices. These three are just a subset of different material behaviors. But it's important to note that both the materials at microscopic level and the effective properties of the solids all have linear elastic behavior.